Welcome back, everyone. Um, so what I'm showing you at the moment is, and you might think that the slides are, are not working, actually, but they are working. Uh, what I'm showing you at the moment is how some people experience the web, the web that we all know and the web for which we are coding pretty much every day. Banner. Name. JS Heroes. Open source community event. The 23rd of April 24th. To visit it. Link. Buy your conference ticket. You are currently on a link. To click this link, press control, option, space. Heading level one. News. So what, what you just experienced was uh, the exact experience that a visually impaired person has when navigating the web. So you see, it's, it's a pretty different experience than what we are used to. And throughout this talk, we're going to try to understand how we can better help um, all the users of the web, how we can better address all the, all the needs of all the users um, of the web. My name is Alex. I'm coming from Cluj. I, you can find me on Twitter at Alex and Moldovan. You can also find me on Medium. Uh, and if you want to follow along the slides or if you want to catch the slides later, well, I have a lot of references throughout this, a lot of links, especially in the bottom part. Uh, so there's no need for you to, uh, to take pictures. You can just take the link. It's already publicly available. It's bit.ly slash vox-a11y. Um, I work at a company at a startup in Cluj called Teleport HQ. Maybe some of you have seen this video, which went viral a couple of months ago. We, we work in um, b building the next generation infrastructure for developers, things like wireframe to code or design to code. Uh, and we work on uh, open source code generators. If you're interested in that part, I'll be more than happy to talk with you about it afterwards. So come find me and ask me, ask me about our work. Uh, I'm also part of the JS Heroes community. Uh, woo. We, we organize one of the biggest JavaScript conferences in this side of Europe. And uh, next year, we already announced the event is going to be on the 23rd and 24th of April. So I'd be very happy to see uh, as many of you there as, as possible, of course. Now, when we talk about uh, accessibility, a lot of people ask me, like, why do you want to talk about accessibility? Or, or why do you even uh, want to bring that subject to, to a conference? And I have two reasons for that. One is because I like to challenge myself to, to learn new things and to, to do things differently. And the other one, which is actually much more important, is that the topic itself is not very well covered. The topic itself is uh, a lot of people are not aware about it. A lot of people are not aware of the implications of not having accessible interfaces. So my goal today is to take you through a couple of stages uh, of understanding accessibility from different perspectives. And these stages are somehow uh, mirroring my own way of understanding accessibility. And step by step, you will, you will see, you will get a be be better and better uh, like enlarged spectrum, let's say, for, for the entire field. So when you start, right, first thing is you have no idea what accessibility is, right? So that's, for me, it's stage number one, right, awareness. And you if you have no idea what accessibility is, according to Wikipedia, accessibility is the design of products, devices, services, or environments for people with disabilities. And particularly from this definition, I'd like to highlight something very, very important. Accessibility is designed for people. And this will be a recurring th theme throughout the talk. I will keep referring to this idea because this is very powerful if you think about it. And this is what makes it a very human-centric activity. Um, Accessibility is defined uh, as a standard by W3C, a web accessibility initiative, and they define the web content accessi accessibility guidelines, currently at version 2.1. You can find the link online. You can find the entire specs there of what it means for an interface to be, uh, to be accessible. OK, so this was short because okay, we have the definition. We have a, 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 a quick understanding. The second stage where most people are after understanding what accessibility is about is they start hearing misconceptions. And there are a lot of misconceptions about accessibility and about its implications. And I would like to just, just to debunk a bunch of them. Um, our country does not have accessibility regulation. Well, this is a good one 
because most of the times what people mean, our country does not have any law by which a private person can sue a private entity for not providing an accessible interface. But this is a misconception because most of the countries in uh, the European Union, I mean the entire European Union, uh, North America, uh, Brazil, India, Australia, Japan, and other countries in the world have adopted WCAG as a standard in all their public institutions. And it's only a matter of time before the private sector also get some better regulation about this. So it's clearly not something, even if the case is today that you, you're not forced to provide that, it's definitely not here to stay as a rule. The second one, and maybe the most, like, most difficult one to overcome, is saying that our website or our application does not have any users with disabilities. And to debunk this, I'm going to make a parallel. In, in the Second World War, the, the British RAF were trying to figure out uh, how to better armor their planes, right? And they were analyzing planes, they were coming back after combat and seeing where the bullets went in in those planes. And doing like an anal a statistical analysis, they were saying that these are the parts that need to be better armored. And of course they were looking at the wrong data set. They were missing out all the planes that were never returning to base, the planes that were getting shot down. And th those planes had the bullets in the engine parts and in the cockpit area. So similarly, when you say that your website does not have users with disabilities, you might be looking at the wrong data set if you're looking strictly at your particular website. And finally, accessibility does not have any return of investment. This is something that product managers or business people will tell you, and they put accessibility in the same area as offering support for legacy browsers or, uh, I don't know, whatever, whatever activity that just needs some time in between some, like, real development. Um, this is a myth because according to the World Report on Disability uh, from 2011, so keep in mind this was eight years ago, um, there are one, more than one billion people in the world with some form of disability, that's 15% of the population, and between 110 and 190 million have significant difficulties in functioning, including 65 million plus of completely people who have completely lost their eyesight. So if that's not a good enough market for, for a business, I'm afraid that the, their, their calculations are a bit wrong. Um, okay, we talked briefly, we talked about accessibility and we talked about it with respect to uh, people with disabilities. But keep in mind what I said at the beginning, right? Designing for people. Let's try to understand the spectrum of accessibility. Like, uh, which are the users which can get affected by accessibility? And let's try to figure out if there are more users outside the, the number of people which actually have a permanent disability. And I'm going to give you a couple of personas, if you want, of, of people that can be affected by um, what I also call an accessibility issue. Again, designing for people, keep in mind that accessibility is not only for people with disabilities. Let's take a mother with two kids that, I'm not sure how many of you are in this situation, I, 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 haven't, uh, I, I don't have the personal experience, but I know a lot of people that are in this situation. And when you have two kids, you mostly don't have your two hands available to, to work on the, to, like, to navigate the internet, to buy stuff online, to order food. Uh, similar situation, when you have a broken hand, you have a temporary disability, right? So keyboard navigation becomes critical at that point in order for you to properly navigate the web in, in certain situations. Uh, imagine a person getting older, like losing some of the reflexes, maybe losing some of, some of the um, accuracy of their eyesight, or even uh, starting, to having, starting to having tremors associated with old age. They have problems, for example, on touch devices. They have problems distinguishing contrasts when the contrast ratio is not enough. Um, imagine a person living in a country where internet is very expensive. For example, we are privileged in Romania to have some of the cheapest and fastest internet in the world, but there are a lot of countries where you have to, you only have 3G or 2G connections, and you have to pay by uh, per megabyte. And most of the websites will download 10, maybe even more megabytes when you access them. So you start thinking like, how much does it cost for me to access this website? And if it costs 10 cents, you start thinking like, does it 
Is it actually relevant? Like, can I, do, am I actually uh, blocked from this website because I cannot afford to navigate on it? And this is a real problem that people have in a lot of developing countries. Also, uh, like Simona actually mentioned in the morning, uh, there are a lot of people in the world that, for which English is not their native language, or people that don't have a good understanding of English. When, but yet our content is mostly in English, and we don't have proper translations, and we don't have video captions. So you see, slowly bringing more and more users, we, we get to the point where accessibility can actually affect anyone, and can af actually affect anyone in the room here. And I actually, myself can be affected by that as a power user of the internet. So if you go, for example, I have, I, I, I'm sorry to make a, a rant about a certain company, but for example, if I want to go to Evernote and check my notes in the browser, it says, sorry, Evernote web is not supported on Android browsers. And it's not the legacy phone or anything. It's simply that they don't have a web mobile version of their, uh, of their service. So as a power user, as a person with no physical disability, still I have, I am unable to access a basic service, right? I might have some important notes here. I might be far from my laptop. There are countless situations in which this can actually affect you. So yeah, accessibility can impact our lives, and we might not be aware of all the scenarios in which it might be affecting. Now that we understand this, we get to the real, to the, to the messy situation. And at this point, the talk is going to be, um, is going to sound a bit uh, terrifying, maybe. But I, I think that mainly the fault for all these problems is us, the developers. Um, I think that in a way we are a bit dreamy, right? As developers, we like to work with the latest frameworks. We like to work with all the new technology, with all the cool libraries. We like to build whatever is the hottest framework right now. And we often forget that our job is to build an interface that works for, for, for as many people as possible. So I think it's about a trade-off here. I think it's about us understanding that uh, the users have some needs. They have, uh, we have some needs as developers to, like, to advance in our careers, let's say, to learn new things. But there's a trade-off here, and there's, a, there's, an, uh, there's an idea of how do we prioritize this. And most of the times, unfortunately, and I, I would say, like, let's say 90% of the times, we as developers prioritize our needs uh, ex uh, rather than prioritizing the needs of the users. So I like this quote that emphasizes this even more by Ralph Johnson, one of the authors of the classic design patterns book. He says, before software can be reusable, it first has to be usable. But think about it, as a developer, when you start a project, the first thing that comes to mind is how we can reuse that thing, how we can build a better scalable architecture. We never think about how can we first build a usable piece of software. Um, let's talk about usability, right? Usability uh, is translated into user experience. So, User experience as a term has been uh, very much associated with uh, design, with the visual part. Like user experience is, uh, represents those tiny improvements that we make, that make our users uh, happier when they navigate, right? Um, all these small animations, all these nice user flows that gets them through the, through the, through the workflows that we want and so on and so forth. Um, but there are two things, there are two categories of of needs that we address here for the users. And I'd like to compare it with food, right? I hope everybody had a good meal, so you I, I was a bit afraid because I was supposed to talk before lunch, and I wasn't sure that this was the right picture to put, but now it, it works. Um, so on one hand, you have the basic food, right? What we all, that we, we all know that we need that in order to survive. On the other hand, we have, let's say, the, the happy food, right? The, the, the part that makes our lives happier. But we know that when we address the idea of, of food consumption, hopefully we go for the basic food first and then we go for the delight. Well, in case of the user's needs, we have to do it the same way. So let's try to define what are the user's needs. Um, similarly with how we have the pyramid of human needs, we can have the pyramid of uh, user's needs, right, on, on the web. And from what we discussed, right, what's fundamentally the first need of any user. Of course, it's availability and accessibility. 
Because whatever experience you build, whatever cool framework or library or design pattern you used, no us the, any user that gets blocked when accessing your service will not be able to benefit from that. After availability and accessibility, we, we have safety and privacy. Once the users are in, we have to ensure that the website is secure. We have to ensure that um, we, we value their safety and their privacy. After that, we have convenience and cost. Things that we discussed about, like how much data does it cost for a user to, um, to access the website? Uh, how fast does it load? Does it, do I have to wait one minute on a 3G connection behind a spinner to have, that, to have that information available to me? And finally, at the very end of the scale, we have the delightful experience, right? The, the, wh what we traditionally have been thinking about user experience, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Sadly, from the developer perspective, the priorities are all messed up. We do like this. Right? When we spend a tremendous amount of time with, with our design teams thinking whether this shade of red, does it better persuade our users to click on that? Or uh, is this border properly aligned here? Or uh, all these things which are at the very top of the, of the, of the priority, at the very uh, up end of the priority. Then we might work a bit on performance because someone told us that uh, performance is a good uh, indicator of conversion. And then if we have time, we might make sure that like, we use HTTPS and our website is safe. And finally, if we do have some bit of time, maybe maybe some projects end up and also supporting like screen readers or stuff like that. So my, my goal and my advocating about accessibility is not only strictly about specific accessibility rules and practices. It's mostly about turning this whole pyramid around and turning our priorities towards the users, the, the people which we are impacting with our work. OK, we went so far. Now let's briefly touch on some of the practical implications. Right? We, we, we got an understanding of accessibility. We got an understanding of how it can impact, how we understand how our work impacts the lives of, of our users. And let's go through some practical ideas, what, what, what to look for, right? what to what to pay attention to when working on a project from the perspective of ensuring an accessible and inclusive interface. Um, and I have three different categories here as the way, I, the way in which I classify them. Number one being the visual side. So on the visual side, the first one is color contrast. And surprisingly, this is actually the, one of the biggest problems of accessibility worldwide because uh, color blindness affects one in every 12 males and one in every 200 females. So it's a, it has a higher incidence in, in males, but still it's a huge number com when you consider the, entire, the, the amount of population in the world. So a lot of people have problem distinguishing several types of contrast, I know red on blue and all these kind of low contrast combinations of colors. And for this, you define, of course, the color contrast as the foreground color versus the background color, right? Black over white has the highest contrast. As you go with a lighter and lighter shade of gray, you get a lower and lower contrast, up to the point where it's one-to-one, -one, where you cannot actually distinguish the text. So according to WCAG, you should aim for a contrast which is above 4.5. This is called a double A standard. Uh, and there's also a triple A standard for contrast, which is above seven. Um, you should also prioritize text. So like the contrast of things like borders and mar uh, any kind of other visual indicator is not that relevant, but text itself is because it's harder to read. Um, and you should also prioritize smaller text because bigger texts, even if they have lower contrast, they are, more, they are easier to distinguish from, from the background. Uh, there's a tool from uh, WebAIM which uh, calculates color contrast, which gives you ratios. There's also a tool embedded in Chrome DevTools. When you click on a color, if you, if you set a color on, a, on any text, you click on a color, you, have there, you will see the contrast ratio. So you have the double A and the triple A, plus a very nice feature that it will tell you which colors from the entire palette are actually passing the contrast test and which are not, if you want to change things around. Um, also, if you use colors, make sure they are not the only discriminatory 
um, element, right, from something bad and something good. If your validation is simply surrounding an input with a color, some people might not distinguish that color as being bad or as being the, the source of uh, the feature not working. So it's always important to have some sort of pattern, some sort of indicator that, hey, this is where the problem is. Typography, of course, is important because, first of all, your website should not be an eye test for anyone. Um, should keep your text to a minimum of 16 pixels, 16 points text. Anything less than that gets very hard to read, especially on mobile devices. Um, font families should be consistent because it was proven that uh, just having different font families here and there can, can have difficulties. People have difficulties in tracking down and keeping, uh, keeping a good um, pace of reading. Uh, also, 80 characters per line is recommended if you print out uh, longer paragraphs and make sure that those paragraphs have standard spacing and don't, don't, don't play too much with that because the way fonts are built, especially the, um, the sans serif families of fonts, these are specifically built for better readability. Uh, you can find out more about that at the link below. Um, yeah, animations. This is, this is another interesting one. You could actually have an entire talk only on designing safe animations. Uh, a lot of people suffer from something called a vestibular disorder, which means that any rapid movement or unexpected movement it can cause them nausea or dizziness or any other hard, uh, hard difficulties like that. So they are especially sensitive with things like parallax or scroll to animations. Um, the, uh, a practice, a good, a good practice for, for building safer animations is to try to avoid that, try to avoid parallax and scroll to effects because it simply doesn't really make sense. It's just a, a lot of movement for no, no apparent reason. Um, unexpected transitions, like don't have pop-ups that fly over from the left or from the right or just appear randomly and um, give, this, uh, th give these people a lot of trouble uh, understanding what's happening. Um, and if you have, if you must use animations, you can make sure that you support uh, prefers reduced motion, which is a new media query spec, which is now supported in Chrome, uh, Safari, and Firefox. And it allows you to write queries like this. Uh, so if the user sets in their operating system something like, uh, I prefer reduced motion, that the operating system will send that to the browser, which will accordingly trigger those specific media queries. So you could disable animations just for the people that don't want or they're just for the people that are sensitive to that. And there's a very nice article there at the bottom about designing safer web animations, which I encourage you to read, because it's really, it's really eye-opening into the problems of, of, this, of these particular people. OK, um, we talked about the visual. Let's talk about semantic. So as you're building, as the website is being built, the DOM is being constructed, in the background, um, there's also an accessibility tree being built. That accessibility tree contains all the information needed by assistive technology um, to interpret the content of the page. If you remember at the beginning, there was a screen reader going through some page, going through elements, going through um, landmarks, going through lists and stuff like that. All that information is contained into that accessibility tree. And that accessibility tree cannot be built if you're not using a proper uh, proper semantics in your HTML. So things like main, like nav, header, um, he headings, and stuff like that. If everything is a div, then the screen reader will only understand text and will only read out text. So the user of a website that has only div, it suffers from what I call the div fest. I have a mistake there with the label. Um, so when you have a div fest, pretty much the user has to go through the entire content without any structure, just like it's just like taking the entire text and copy pasting it in a like in a notepad document or something like that. Um, the landmarks again are really important because they will give the screen reader user a sense of what are the main areas. Okay, I want to go to the main part. I want to go to the navigation and get to another page. Um, also use headings in the right order. This is something that I was messing up so much at the beginning because no one told me that headings should not be used for uh, making text bigger, right? When, when you start learning HTML, no one, no one necessarily tells you that and everyone starts putting, oh, I need this text bigger, I'm gonna put it as an H2. 
No, no, it's really bigger. Let's put it on H1. So uh, headings are really important because uh, power users of screen readers have a shortcut to go through the headings of a page. And they stop when they, when, when they have a heading of interest to them. But if the headings are not in the right order, they will not make sense of the content. They will just say, oh, it's a heading level one, and it's a heading level three, and it's a heading level two. Do I go back to heading level three? Like they, they, they don't understand the linearity and the, the, the proper arrangement of the entire article. OK, menus are also important as elements because they, again, uh, screen reader users use a lot of uh, quick navigations, right? They don't go, they don't wait for the screen reader to read out the entire content of the page. So use a nav element for that because that's quickly identified by, uh, by any screen reader. And inside the nav, use lists, unordered lists, uh, and list items because those by default are fully accessible. So as you, as you put, uh, this is, for example, something that we did for the, uh, for the JS Heroes website. We, we started, we, we put everything in an unordered list, so each uh, element, each page link there is contained in a list item. So as, as a screen reader user ends up on the nav element, the nav element will say, oh, this is a list of six items. And you start using your arrows and say, uh, list number one out of six, list um, item number two out of six, and so on. This is very, very useful information that can help them navigate the site better. Um, images and links are also super important. Uh, and this is another big mistake that a lot of, a lot of de developers do. We don't define clear titles for links, right? We just assume that whatever text is inside that link would be, would be good enough. And a lot of websites have links which just say uh, read more or click here. So those kind, of, those kind of texts or those kind of labels will, when the user goes tabbing through the content and they do that a lot, they will just hear, click more, click more, click more, and they will have no idea where that link will actually take them. So for example, for the speakers here, which are similar links in a page, instead of saying click more or see the speaker, we explicitly said visit the page of and the name of the speaker. This way when the screen reader goes over that link, uh, the screen reader will read the exact text, visit the page of whoever speaker you're on. Uh, for images also you can use the meaning meaningful alt texts. If you don't put any alt label, the screen reader will start reading the name of the image. Do you know what images are usually called on the web? Like X, D, 1, F, O, 0, X, X, F, blah, 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 and three, 32 characters or something. Uh, that's a bad experience for, for, for them. Um, OK. Finally, the interaction part. Um, for interaction, keyboard navigation, again, is really crucial, not only for um, not only for people with permanent disabilities, but also for people with temporary disabilities. I have good, two good examples here. For example, on the, um, not sure if you see, on the CSS trick side, they, they did a redesign. So as you tab through the, through the cards there and you focus on the next card, the same action that happens on hover also happens on focus. Um, plus, the entire content is uh, fully accessible, so if you tab your way through the content, you will actually have the same experience as just simply hovering with your, with your mouse over all those cards, or similar experience uh, hovering over the speakers here at the, at the bottom. Um, so tab navigation is crucial because, again, screen reader users, and even, even, even I, I started doing this a lot. I go on the website just to check how good they have support for that. And I start tabbing my way through the site to see where do I end up. And you have no idea how, how badly they can, they can screw it up. Um, for menus, uh, we have to support things like left, right. Uh, tab, tab elements are also really important. When you have, on, when you have a tab, a tabbed interface, it's a very, it's a very good uh, support to have left right arrows to go through the different tabs and the down arrow to focus on in on the inner tab panel or I know screen or carousels or uh, things like that this kind of non-native let's say elements escape if you have models enter to to click on buttons stuff like that any any kind of support and a lot of these are by default we just have to make sure that we don't mess with them actually um, 
This is a bad one. Never use outline zero. I haven't seen these like outline none important. Um, I get it that designers don't like the default outlines, but as soon as you remove the outline for a from a website, automatically there's no keyboard navigation because the user has no idea what's the focus. Um, this is actually taken from an older version of Reset CSS. And whoever wrote it said, remember to define focus styles. Right. No one was doing that. Um, so try to never do outline zero. If you must remove it, please style your own outline. If you don't have a way, if you have to fight till the end to, with the designer, you definitely don't have, uh, don't have to have outline. Then at least you can have support for keyboard outline using what input, which is a small utility, which will allow you to have um, outlines only when navigating through with, with a keyboard. So when you click with the mouse on an input, you will see no outline. If you tab your way uh, to the interface, you will see that. Um, focus management, we already talked about it. When you have focus, when you have a hover or an on-click, you should accompany that with the focus. Try to follow the natural tab order. So you see here, I'm tabbing through the form. I'm going first element, second element, then the button. If you're using tab index greater than zero, you'll just mess with that, and it's considered an anti-pattern. And oops. What did I do? Oh. And uh, for example, for model windows, make, make sure that you trap the focus, because otherwise, users will just tap their way out of the model, but you will still have, from a visual perspective, the model open in your, in your, in your browser. And after navigation, this is also an important one that is not solved by a lot of routing tools, unfortunately. When you navigate, especially in single page applications, from one page to another, focus just went goes nuts. There's no, there's no specific focus handling for after navigation. Um, OK, final point on touch area. Uh, again, people can have, they, they might not have the same dexterity as a and 20 plus user. They might have tremors. Make sure you have at least 44 pixels on, on touch devices of interaction, so like squares of at least 44 pixels. And make sure you have enough space between them also. Uh, and, of course, for some elements, you can add labels next to them to increase the, the touch surface, basically, of that element. Okay, just a quick rundown through the tools. You have a lot of screen readers available, JAWS and N NVDA for Windows, Orca for Linux, VoiceOver is the default one from uh, OS X that you can use. Um, Xcore is a great library that uh, can, you can integrate into your continuous integration, into your test suite. You can integrate it in Cypress. You can integrate it in Jest. And it will just run uh, accessibility tests on all your pages, and it will give you all the different uh, violations that you're doing on, on particular parts or particular elements. Lighthouse was already mentioned today. It has an entire suite of accessibility tests. So you, can, you can just have them in your browser already. Uh, totally is another great tool that you can just attach to your website, and it will give you a lot of interesting insights into the use of headings and the color contrasts on different elements on the screen. And finally, two projects that I really hope will get more attention in the coming, in the coming years. RichUI is a library created by Ryan Florence of accessible components for React. So all the components are built with accessibility in mind, with things like supporting focus, uh, supporting keyboard navigation and so on. Uh, Inclusive Components is a project by Hayden Pickering about uh, what it means to build truly inclusive and accessible components of the web. And he has a lot of examples on things like cards, carousels, menus, and tab interfaces and stuff like that. OK, I need to take a one second break. So I know we talked about a lot of things and like We've been in kind of 15 minutes, we went through so many things. And the road seems like very hard, and now all of a sudden you have to take care of another uh, category of issues, right? When you, when you work on a website, you might consider that now all your projects will get longer and longer because you have to maintain that. But a good friend of mine actually told me that accessibility is something that you learn once and then you apply forever. Once you learn it, once you have it in your system, it's your way of working. It's not something that you actively have to think about to support, to increase the, the timeline of all your issues, of all your features that you, that you develop. And I also like this quote, uh, be inspired by what you don't know. This is something that 
drives me every day, and whenever I find something that is intriguing, whenever I find something that I feel is, would be beneficial for a user, I'm immediately hooked with that, and I'm inspired to try it out and see how it goes. Ultimately, I think we have to take ownership as developers of the entire accessibility process. No one should have to come to us as an expert and say, you have to do these rules, you have to obey these things. If we know how to do it ourselves, if we know how to integrate all the accessibility practices into our regular workflows, we don't have to ask permission from anyone to work on accessibility. And uh, also, we have to understand that our work is impacting the lives of the users, whether we, whether we like it or not. Um, and finally, maybe the, the key takeaway from this is that working on accessibility is not about doing someone a favor. It's simply about doing your job and ensuring that you provide a minimal user experience to everyone and to the entire population of the web. Thank you.